Hello and welcome everyone to our keynote session and kicking off of the Project Virtual Conference 2018. Today we have Corey Sauls with us and he is going to pre be presenting on the evolution of technology, people and processes and the next gen project management office. Before we get started, I just want to let the attendees know that you can use the chat option at the bottom of your screen to chat and ask any questions. Without further ado, handing it over to Corey. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, just to verify, everyone can hear me. And yes, you're coming through loud and clear. Great, great. Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Thanks to the Project Virtual Conference uh, and the team for providing with this opportunity to, to share some key learnings uh, within my organization, as well as uh, being able to uh, uh, share some key learnings that uh, each of you I know on the call are going through as you lead your projects and your PMO organizations. Uh, solving problems together uh, is the best way for us to be able to leverage best practices. And I wanted to, to thank uh, this organization for this opportunity. Also like to uh, thank Cindy Lewis for this opportunity as well, partnering with her organization over the past three years uh, has allowed uh, the trained organization to uh, transform in a number of ways, which we'll talk about today. Uh, and we'd like to thank Cindy for her contribution toward that effort. So just a little bit about myself uh, as we get started. I've been in the industry for 21 years and have served in uh, four different industries uh, throughout my career, uh, from automotive to um, commercial and manufacturing, as well as serving in five different functional areas within um, different organizations. Uh, so I've worn a number of different hats uh, within the uh, different functions in our value stream from uh, from con conceptualization and design all the way through manufacturing and customer facing uh, roles. Uh, but the key connection to all those different roles is that I've always had to lead projects in each of those different functions. Uh, projects are pretty broad, uh, but everything we do every day is a project in some way. Even getting to work was a project. Uh, so we do projects everywhere every day. And uh, in every role that I've been in, I've had that experience. So today what I'd like to do or the goals for this discussion today is to first introduce you to Ingersoll Rand and train in the markets that we serve so that we have a good foundation. But also discuss the challenges that PMOs and project managers in PMOs face today and present to you six key capabilities of the future PMO leadership as well as the PMO organization and project managers. And uh, as you have questions, uh, as Cindy indicated, the method for capturing questions, I'll be able to do my best to also answer questions during the presentation. So if you look at Ingersoll Rand, a little bit about Ingersoll Rand and Train. Uh, Ingersoll Rand is a $14.2 billion diversified industrial. And we focus on creating comfortable and sustain sustainable and efficient environments globally with our products. Most people know us by our brands such as Club Car or Thermal King or Train, uh, with Ingersoll Rand being our parent, our parent company. If you look at uh, us as a company, we've been around for 145 years and we're headquartered in Swords, Ireland. And from a stock exchange standpoint, our symbol is IR. And we're currently at $89, so I'm hoping that continues to trend upward. If you look at the, our global footprint, we are around, 100, uh, around 80, 867 facilities or buildings that have the IR logo with 51 manufacturing locations worldwide and over 40,000 employees uh, globally as well. And if you look at the industries that we serve, we serve a number of key industries uh, which are presented here. Um, uh, and so our products touch a number of different uh, uh, industries globally. But as I said before, we are best known by our brands. So if you look to the right side here, a number of these brands should be familiar. If you've heard of Train, uh, Nothing Stops a Train, or Thermal King, um, as well as Nexia. And this is just a snippet of the products that we serve. 
uh, on, in our, on our climate side of our business. We also have an industrial side uh, with RO and pumps and, um, and, and power tools as well. So the first thing I'd like to do is set the tone for this meeting. Uh, before, we before we dive into today's topic, let's first set the right mindset. As each of you, I'm sure, understand or know, change is always guaranteed, but how we respond to it is a choice. And so driving the right type of mindset or growth mindset within your organization, within your culture, within everything that you do every day, really helps to promote the right behaviors and the right success for and the right foundation for change. So I'm sure many of you have experienced change when it was difficult, uh, as change always is. And having the right uh, behaviors, the right attitude and approach, uh, not just in the tool, and not just changing the tools or processes that you're uh, trying to improve, but also the DNA of your organization, the behaviors, and the relationships and interactions is 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 foundational or paramount to being able to drive sustainable change in your organization. So within uh, the PMO organization, this is the framework that represents my PMO and how we are structured. So we're focused in six key areas as an organization around maturing the PMO, uh, engaging our stakeholders, and uh, enabling management of our project portfolio of all the projects that we, that we, we lead. Uh, driving the manage, uh, managing of methodology and standards and the governance or, or run rules around our, our, um, our methods. Enabling and growing project leaders and their skills, competencies, and capabilities. And of course, what uh, all PMOs do, which is to deliver projects at the speed required by the business. The green areas are representing a couple key areas that I wanted to focus on today around driving PMO maturity and measuring performance on the left, driving uh, portfolio planning and project prioritization um, in the middle, as well as leveraging the PPM tool uh, to be able to utilize that, developing the skills and cap competencies and capabilities of our project leaders on our teams, and managing our resources across our projects. So first, let's take a step back and from a broad perspective, understand the transformation that's happening uh, out in, in our, our global environment. From a broad perspective, digitalization and the speed of change outside our companies is, is increasing everywhere. Just think about all the projects that you want the latest model of today, such as cell phones. They are consistently changing on a consistent basis. The speed of change is increasing every day. For Train, we in the past could design a product for four years and we could sell it for 20. Today, that's seven years. So as an organization, we have to start to shift. And if you look along the bottom here, these are some fundamental areas where there is paradigm changes happening today. The way we structure our work, we are starting to shift from projects to products and product value streams. The way we fund our work is changing from a traditional CER or a business case model to a multimodal or block funding model where we are funding a, a step in the development of a product, which allows us the agility to maximize our funding investment to where we see, see the most value. The way we get our work done is also shifting from the traditional waterfall or stage gate process to more iterative or hybrid methodologies that allow us to be able to focus on value and the interactions of our teams and the work inherent in those teams, as opposed to just the traditional, all work is complete, let's move to the next step. And lastly, we're trying to change how we oversee our work from a narrow focus on fewer portfolios to a broader focus into more of our product portfolios and making sure that we are investing in the right products at the right time based on market demand and, and consistently and dynamically adjusting for how the market is changing because it is changing so much more rapidly today than in years past. So how does the PMO change to enable this? When we look at it, I look when we look at this, I want to focus on three key areas. From a people standpoint, 
we have to change our behaviors, our capabilities, competencies, and, and, and how we engage with each other and how we interact with each other. When we look at the processes that we're gonna follow, how does that change? What are the step by, what's the step-by-step step of how we develop our offerings? What's the start, what are the things that we need to start doing that we don't today? What are the things we need to stop doing that don't add value and what stays the same? And what are the interdependencies that regardless of function, when we look at it from a project perspective, are necessary to promote project success? How do, in other words, how do we value people interaction over process steps? How do we break down the functional silos and do what's best for the business and the evolution of the project? And lastly, what are the tools that we should have in our hands in order to wield that change? What are the systems that we should have in place? What automation do we need to have in place for repeatable activities? How do we keep, keep it simple and intuitive? And again, how do we enable interaction so that we continue to drive value? So if you look at how, how this transformation is happening within our organization, there's four key areas of influencer transformation. So starting on the right side, um, as an organization, we traditionally uh, are, as a PMO, responsible for governing and delivering projects. But we're also responsible for orchestrating delivery and driving team workflows and the work that needs to be done. We also have to develop and enable the our digital talent to make sure that because everything is becoming connected, that we have a good understanding of what that needs to look like. And most importantly, we need to ensure investment alignment. Gone are the days of the traditional CER or business case that's gonna go four years, we're gonna to continue to pour money into something, a team goes into a black box and develops everything. And we just, we just do a series of touch points at gates in order to make decisions to continue. So how do we, do, how do we make our investment alignment better fit the change in dynamics that happen as we execute the project. So if we look today, as we, as, as I, uh, on the right side here, one of the challenges that we have is that PMOs tend to spend, or 64% of our PMOs are spending most of their time on this right side in executing projects, in defining the run rules and the methodology around our projects and enforcing compliance. Are we following the process? enabling project level prioritization and funding decisions, building the business case and presenting it at decision points, planning and allocating resources, and then reporting project health and status, as well as benefits realization. Are we making, are we delivering what we said? The key takeaway here is that when we look at the market, the customers and our business, we need, to, they're all driving us to the left so that we are trying to coordinate multi uh, methodologies in order to deliver our products, especially on the digital sides of our business where we need to, where there's a continuous feedback loop from, the cus from our customers, from the field, and, and that as we develop our products, the speed of change is happening so fast outside our business, we need to integrate that into how we develop our offerings. From a people standpoint, we have to develop our project managers from a, digital, uh, from a digital skill standpoint and foster true product ownership and the integration of the product leadership, project leadership around the rest of the business in order to drive um, the development of our offerings considering all of the outside forces around our projects. And as stated before, also facilitate an operating model uh, toward a product focus and making sure that our investments are in line with um, what the market is demanding. So what does the future PMO and in, in that PMO, our project managers look like versus what we have today? What are the skills and abilities and competencies that he or she should possess? Because in most businesses, the PMO leaders must work across functions to ensure project success. So, there, so what I'm showing you here are six key skills, capabilities, or competencies that he or she must possess. And I'd like to, to now take you through those six key areas with some examples of how we have experienced this change with train. So when we talk about investment, uh, the investment steward, 
many of you may understand that as a project manager, you are developed, the traditional project manager builds the, pro, the business case and is shepherding that business case through uh, business acceptance all the way through project execution to completion and taking something from a concept to complete. And their that investment steward in the digital era must understand how to do that um, in different pockets of the business so that we're investing from a block funding standpoint in a dynamic way. In promoting portfolio prior, a portfolio prioritization approach that emphasizing, emphasizes alignment to our strategic priorities. And incorporate, incorporating viewpoints of those disparate stakeholders across all of our functions into that investment process and being able to effectively communicate to those constituents in a manner or in a way that helps them to make the best decisions for the business. The project manager in this future state is establishing the, guard, the guardrails to foster business ownership and accountability at the right levels of that investment and ensuring that, that, that there is a dynamic and closed loop communication and alignment to the investment to value. If we look at the second skill or attribute, a, a, a project manager must also be an orchestrator. So on the right side, this is showing the traditional skill sets of what a project manager would typically do. A project manager is going to work, um, work beyond the delivery team with our stakeholders and our partners to facilitate coordination and consistent alignment of the overall portfolio as well as the project that they're leading. They also, across the bottom, have to work across delivery teams to provide multi-team coordination to manage risk and interdependencies. Because gone are the days that every project is discrete, discrete and unique and on its own, and either the attributes or, or features of projects are shared or the resources doing the work are shared. And the project manager must be able to work through those complexities in order to deliver project success. And then on the top right within their project, they have to deliver work within those delivery teams with a consistent methodology so that people clearly understand when they walk in every day, here's what's expected of me and here's what I need to do in order to move this project forward. So as each of you maybe are, are, are aware, there's quite a few pieces to trying to focus on those three areas as an orchestrator. If you look across the top left, there's a growing number and diversity of stakeholders that we're touching, whether it's vendor maturity and supplier readiness, whether it's external partnerships, whether it's working in different parts or different functions within the business, the project manager must have the agility and the communication skills and the ability to be able to work across a diversity of stakeholders and satisfy their needs in evolving the project. Across the bottom, they must also be able to work across uh, a number of different projects and methodologies that may be being utilized to best promote each of those individual projects, but also have a clear understanding of the interdependencies regardless of methodology. And then within the work team, they must also uh, continue to work with smaller and more volatile work around that project leaders, or I'm sorry, project team, uh, team members could be working on a number of different projects and making it very clear what they must deliver for the project, each project that they're on. So if we look at the orchestrator, and we look at this from a system standpoint, and I'm sure quite a few of you uh, have different types of PPM systems that you use to manage your people, uh, foster collaboration, uh, and to also manage your schedules. Today, in the bottom right, these are items that are readily available within PPM for our business. We use our PPM system, which we call our PPM, uh, to manage our resources, to manage our phase gate management, to start projects and close projects, and generally to collect discrete or metadata around our projects in order to be able to foster communication on the status and the health of our projects from a project management standpoint. This middle area is where we are today. 
And this gray area from an autom automation standpoint is where we are continuing to grow as a business. And a couple key areas that we're trying to foster is, for example, uh, driving consistent project financial management and being able to manage our, resource, our resources uh, in line with our portfolio. So ensuring that we have a good balance of projects that are active and across our projects that we have the right resource management and resource capacity management to keep the portfolio balanced and keep our, our people balanced so they can maximize their delivery around our projects. Uh, we're also focused around uh, ensuring that we have cross, uh, uh, cross project priority alignment because many of our projects touch other functions and touch other projects. So the interdependencies and the risk associated with those interdependencies is critical for our business, especially from a resource standpoint. So put it, to put it simply, we're trying to ensure that the project mix matches our resource availability and our resource mix to maximize uh, our resource utilization around our projects and therefore the speed and execution of our projects. And lastly, in the top left, this is where we're trying to go. We're trying to build uh, perpetual portfolio planning so that instead of the traditional, and you'll see an example in a moment, the traditional annual AOP or planning all of our resources 12 months in advance and trying to execute that perfect plan perfectly, which never happens, right? And getting more to a perpetual rolling 12 months out in front of us that we are planning our projects from a portfolio or a strategic standpoint and lining that up to the projects that we have active and ensuring that we're that we have good alignment interdependency management so that we have clear alignment between all of our projects and where we have risks as well as good project ex ex escalation management and predictive risk profiling so that across our our disparate portfolio of projects that we have active that we are focusing our best talent on our projects that carry the most value or have the highest risk. So just to give you an idea of how our business has traditionally operated, our traditional approach has been to plan 12 months ahead, as you can see here. And the dotted line, the, the green dotted line represents 100% uh, resource utilization and the black dotted line represents our AOP plan that we would do each year and say, here's what I'd like to go do. And in that traditional model, we typically try to measure variance to plan and try to execute that perfect plan perfectly. However, as you can see, this is what actually happened. And if you look at each of these different data points, these were things that happened along that year that caused that variance. Whether projects didn't execute to what we planned, a project recycled and we had to to uh, execute that project longer, or more projects the business had opportunities that presented themselves that back 12 months back we weren't aware of, but they could benefit the business that we wanted to introduce. And how do we sh shuffle our uh, portfolio to position ourselves to maximize that opportunity, but also continue to balance our resources. So the key here is that we had to shift to dynamic planning accepting that change is normal and really trying to set our position ourselves to to define what an acceptable accept, an acceptable amount of change looks like and design our systems to account for that change and and get and put that agility in place with our systems our tools and our behaviors of our people so that we are perpetually planning our portfolio over a 12 month, 12 months out in front of ourselves, as opposed to just this large annual plan that we expect to execute perfectly, but never does. So if you look at our PPM tools specifically, um, on the left side, this is showing industry trends and how organizations are using their PPM tools. How, how, do, how do we use them? Most PMOs use their PPM tools around risk and issue and change management or capacity planning or resource allocation and budget and forecasting around their projects. 
You'll see in the middle portion here, there's quite a few other activities or tools that, that many organizations use their PPM tool for. And on the right side, I'm showing the past three years within our business and how we have utilized our PPM tool to be a central management tool for how we manage our projects, our people, and our decisions from a strategic standpoint. So three years ago, on the right side, we were focused on the PMO really driving standardization around our projects and what the governance around what our project types would be, how we would track our projects, and what information we would put into our PPM tool in order to drive decision making around individual projects. The following year, we focused around resource and demand management. Once we had a clear understanding of all the projects that were active within our business, whether MPD, productivity, any different project type, and we understood that the, the resource demand from those projects, we really had, we had to quickly get our hands wrapped around uh, resource and demand management to capacity and understanding how this needed to look. We built skills and abilities within our organization to effectively take historical information around our projects and estimate out our projects through project profiles to give us the ability to statistically predict what projects would need from a resource mix standpoint based on the size and complexity of that project in our business. And in the green area in the bottom right, this is where we are focused today. As a business, we're trying to grow and evolve our business to looking at the overall portfolio, looking at the, the strategic drivers of our business and how we want to grow our business. And ensuring that the projects that we have active fit that strategic plan. And that our overall project portfolio has projects that represent that strategy. In other words, that our projects give us a, a strong match or strategic fit to the direction that our business wants to go and the projects we have active fit that strategy. Also important, we had to shift the, and define the roles and responsibilities throughout our organization to ensure that each of the functions within our organization understood clearly what their role was in the value stream. This was one of the toughest shifts our organization had to go through and is continuing to trans, uh, transform in this area today. So that each person that's on the bus understands which seat they should be in and understands what their role is and executes that effectively. And as I stated before, from a project governance standpoint that we clearly outline each of the different project types within our business who owns those project types, who supplies information of those project types, but equally important, how do we estimate out those project types from an information standpoint so that we, could, we can plan efficiently what we will need for each project type and then overall in our portfolio get a, an accurate picture of the resource demand for those projects. So next I'd like to take you through what that looks like for our business and just a couple key terms I want you to understand before going into this example uh, are pr presented on the right side. Um, so our growth, our growth portfolio management process is how we optimize our investments within our business and decide these are the, uh, these are the um, from a strategic standpoint, these are the focus areas of our business and therefore here are the projects that represent that. As I stated before, our PPM system, which is called, is called IRPPM, is our central management system for managing our project portfolio and matching those projects to the resource constraint planning uh, that, and giving us an outlay, a resource outlay of our resource demand, but also is a great tool for allowing us to be able to go through what if analysis so that we can trade projects in and out to maximize our resource utilization. Our IRPDP process is our product of, is our best in class product development phase gate process uh, and allows us to uh, is, is, a, is a standard standard methodology for how we take our offerings from concept to finish. So if I step you through an example, this is how our business tries to step through um, our investments. 
As I stated before, our business defines strategic initiatives and timing through our GPM process to decide here's how our business, these are our focus areas for our particular business. Do we want to increase market share in existing markets? What percentage do we want to focus on expansion into new markets? Where do we want to, or do we want to improve customer satisfaction, quality, or several key attributes, or what I would call business drivers and the weightings of those business drivers. From there, we try to take all the different projects and this, at this step, second step, this is not resource constrained or budget constrained. This is looking at the overall portfolio or putting all the chess pieces on the table to understand how we can evaluate, prioritize, and, and prioritize our investments. So we take those different drivers, as you can see across the top, and the intention is to look at all of our project offerings down the left side and look for projects that have the best strategic alignment to our business objectives. And from that, we're able to um, identify all of our project offerings and which ones have the highest strategic fit and therefore uh, put our projects into a one to 100 priority order. From there, we try to assess uh, in the third step, the financial or budget constraints as well as the resource availability by resource type constraints of our offerings. A simple way of saying now we have to set ourselves financially and based on resource availability to, to level set ourselves to what we have the ability to be able to execute. And this is how we, we use our, 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 our PDP process to take those offerings from a concept all the way through to launch. So the third focus area or competency for a project manager is to be a talent enabler. And I won't read each of the focus areas on the, over to the right, but these are the skills and competencies that a project manager must possess in this future state. They must have good stakeholder partnership, good judgment. They must be able to manage and communicate risk effectively lead to, uh, from a team leadership standpoint, be able to work across as well as down into teams to bring value, drive ownership and commitment, and also have good learning agility and business knowledge so that there is a clear outline uh, for that project manager and how he leads a team. I look at my project managers as entrepreneurial leaders, as if they're running their own business, as opposed to a project manager that is just managing people. So this is giving you an idea of within, my, within our train business where we are focused today. On the top portion, we tried to focus on these key attributes of project success. And we surveyed our organization to understand where the organization identifies the most important attributes, which is represented by the yellow dots. And the bars are representing our maturity level in those areas. So you'll note that I have arrows next to areas where there is a space between where the dot is and where the bar is. And this is showing where we have a strategic gap within our business and therefore as a PMO organization are areas that we should focus. The key takeaway here is ensuring strategic and stakeholder alignment to make sure the skills and competencies of my team are matching and meeting with that business expectations to ensure success of our projects. So the fourth area is around being a promoter of change. As I stated before, um, if you look at the outside environment of all of our businesses, businesses are, are, are needing to move to much closer toward a customer centric focus and being able to understand intimately the needs of our customers to be able to drive through our products. Moving across to the right, we also must improve our speed and flexibility and uh, speed to market of our offerings to ensure that our products are meeting the market demand and hitting market based on when customers need them. Having fluid role boundaries across each of our projects because project managers must wear a number of hats as we discussed before and therefore being a, an investment steward or a, a change agent or a promoter, um, uh, a talent uh, investment steward or an orchestrator 
are skills, as I stated before, that are very necessary skills for a project manager. And lastly, being able to transform our operating models to fit uh, the new business environment. So if we look at the way our business is transforming in this exact, uh, in this, this particular focus area, 93% of our businesses feel the pressure to increase speed of all of our project offerings to meet market demand. And 81% of our product portfolio uh, must increase our cycle time or cut our cycle by 50% in order to meet our market demand. We also see 73% of our business units that are consistently evaluating their MPD standard work to identify opportunities to reduce our cycle time. And lastly, 71% of our business units are trying to adopt hybrid approaches to product development as the speed of out, outside the business is continuing to increase and we have to meet that challenge. So as an example, the, the current methods we use within our business was what people would traditionally call a waterfall method. And the challenge with that method has been that the, was the product time to market which has been a major drawback for us that we've had to start to try to transform. And it's a major drawback because of its, its sequential in nature, meaning all work must be done for a particular phase. We arrive at a gate, we make a decision, and then we move to the next phase. What's important here to understand is that this sequential approach can tend to waste a lot of time because we're doing things in sequence instead of concurrently. And as an alternative, the concurrent engineering methods of, uh, and many different methods that each of you have heard of, whether it's concurrent engineering, iterative approach, agile, et cetera, uh, allows groups of major design elements to maximize the overlap of their activities across different teams and do work in concurrency. And the, co the key here is to be able to, to map that concurrency and also reduce your cone of uncertainty so that the project risk doesn't increase exponentially because you're doing work in parallel. So if we look at that from a, a visual standpoint, on the left side, there's sp some specific activities that as a business, we have started to try and investigate and implement in our business to drive this transformation. So we've tried to do re, uh, iterative, in the top left, release and iterative planning around our projects and stand up meetings and visual management around our projects, around the work. So the key is we don't have the tradition, in every project, we don't have the traditional two or 3,000 row schedule with interdependencies everywhere and the detail that allows the project manager to have a good understanding of what's happening but is not very visual and apparent to the rest of the project team so that everyone stays on the same page. So what we are shifting to or evaluating uh, within our organization is what you see on the right side, which is a comparison of a traditional waterfall in the top right, which goes through the traditional phases and gates, and, and we're shifting toward more of a concurrent delivery so that once we get to a certain step or stage within the evolution of our projects, that we are doing an iterative release of information into, our, to, into the next phase within our project so that critical path items or long lead time items, whether from a supplier standpoint, uh, from a manufacturing standpoint on equipment, uh, just key, act, act, um, key deliverables in that critical path are started in an efficient manner with sufficient information to minimize risk to ensure that the project moves in an efficient evolution. So this is just giving you a visual of, of how we have changed uh, on some specific projects based on this transformation. The left side is what we did as a business uh, in a traditional waterfall or, or stage, stage gate process, where we would build project schedules and the task would be bottom-up planning. Our task management would be weekly meetings with reconciliation of time sheeting for remaining work. And there's a project manager, if you visualize at the center, managing a project schedule to account for that. Resource management is team estimation with a roll-up 
with issue escalation being problems that present themselves on a weekly basis. The accountability was really at the project manager's shoulders and it was up to that project manager to drive the team in order to drive the work. And we've observed that 30, around 35% of value add time had, was a result of that approach. In some of our projects, we've shifted more to the middle where we have uh, scrum boards and different activities that make the project very visual, visual, uh, visual and visible so that the, the team on an ongoing basis has a clear idea of what needs to get done on a weekly basis. That allowed us to be able to get our value add up to around 55%, but you'll know along the bottom section of this chart that the, the key missing ingredient here was the, the, to have struck trust and alignment across all the project team members so that there was high trust in the schedule and what need to be done by when, that there was high engagement and commitment, and there was clear accountability and tracking across the project. So we're, where we have found success is from an iterative or visual management approach within our business, which has given us around 70% of value add by making the information around the project organic and visible to the project teams on an ongoing basis with stand up meetings on a daily basis, ownership in the project team and the project team leaders, not just in the project manager and clear ownership throughout the project. Uh, based on that transformation. So the fifth focus area is around being a service provider and having the ability to be able to recover troubled projects, continuously improve product line performance, as well as supporting business managed projects. But also being a service provider of information within the business, such as in this example here, where we are showing within our business, this is what we forecasted from an AOP standpoint, which is the green line, what our current forecast is on our projects from our project managers, which is in the maroon line in the middle, and then the people time sheeting their work against that plan so that we have alignment to what people are working on to what our schedule shows. What this allowed us to be able to do is have clear visibility of, of how we are forecasting our work and what people are working on and how well that aligns to what we planned and to be able to adjust accordingly. This view is showing you that that information based on our strategic focus areas of COD or MPD, but also on this next slide from a project standpoint as well. So lastly, uh, we also, and, and most importantly, we're, we will always be program drivers. So project managers within my staff and project managers that are also non-PMO project leaders still lead all these different types of projects that you see across the bottom right. So we're not off the hook uh, as far as delivery of key programs to help the business to be successful. The key takeaway for each of you is that the six focus areas that I just talked about today are equally important because they are skill sets or competencies or capabilities beyond just being the program driver. That allows the project leader to be a business partner within the business, working across functions to promote business success. So in summary, the, the key takes a couple key takeaways. First of all, be able to embrace change. If change is happening faster outside of your business, uh, is happening faster outside of your business, then you're falling behind. Understand your culture and how change happens. Tools and processes and, and the changes of those tools and processes is not enough. Understand your culture and how to change it. Really focus on shifting as many mindsets to a growth mindset that you can because changing behaviors is often the most difficult thing to be able to do, but tools and processes alone won't change your organization or your culture until you change the mindsets. And lastly, uh, have a simple and compelling message and always communicate it consistently. Be the change that you want to promote and drive the change in your everyday actions because leadership 
speaks volumes in the change that you're trying to promote. So in closing, I'd like to thank uh, each of the different sponsors, uh, as well as this opportunity to, to be able to present or give a peer into my business for each of you on the call. And uh, at this point, I welcome questions. Hi, Corey, this is Cindy. So actually, you've generated a lot of passion in our text chat, <laughs> lots of uh, great interactions, and people have really loved some of the slides they've pointed out. A few items maybe you could add some additional comments on. One point, uh, Prasanna mentioned the paradigm of people, processes, and tools is something everyone knows, but the key difference is the focus on interactions. And I wondered if you wanted to comment further on that comment. Sure. So uh, I actually, believe it or not, I have a, I have a PMO leader within my business uh, that uh, I hired a couple of years ago that um, came from an organization where they are doing agile and scrum and, and, and really progressive change within project management and brought them into an organization that I'm sure he would appreciate probably felt like going 10 years back. Um, and so he has a, above his board, uh, a couple statements that really talk about people interaction and positive interaction over processes and governance and rules. And when I brought him on, the first thing he I tried to do, because I was still in that mindset, was try to show him our process and say, you have to learn this because this is the letter of the law. And what I have learned from him in, uh, in uh, quite a bit is how important interactions with people and creating a positive work environment and, uh, and, and really working across the processes and tools with the interactions of them is what helps to promote success. Uh, so it's not just having rules, it's not just having tools, uh, and it's not just functions and titles over doors as much as it's the interactions of the functions in a positive way that really promotes that change. Great, thank you. So let me call out a couple other things here. We had Marco talked about getting accurate resource data to make those portfolio decisions. Seems like that's a challenge. Do you have comments on your processes in addition to what you've already presented? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we are still on that journey. We're in year four of trying to effectively estimate outcomes. We um, originally, we would have, uh, a number of years ago, we, we had everyone going in and putting any information in on a project. And, and until we started tracking actuals against that, we didn't realize how far off we were. Um, today, we are baselining, baselining ourselves by, we created within each of our businesses by product line, we've developed um, five different project profiles that represent five tiers of size or complexity of development of that particular product line. And we, we baselined ourselves from a statistical standpoint in those five tiers, and then we're capturing actual data against those baselines so that each year we get better and better at estimating our outcomes. So it's a journey. Um, we're only halfway through it. But that estimation and the accuracy of that estimation is, 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 is critical for us. The one last point I will make is that this is not about trying to, to create a perfect forecast of work. What is more important is how dynamically we're able to manage that work while we're in the execution in the year and adjust our resources based on outcomes that we either can anticipate or that have changed. So the, the, the key takeaway is having, uh, managing our resources in a dynamic and very visual way, as opposed to trying to perfectly plan and expect it to execute perfectly. Okay, thank you. Well, let's take one more question and then we can have everyone get a short coffee break before next session. So final one, and this is from Dave, any good lessons learned on how to best promote people behavior change? That's a good question. So um, I, I don't know if I would have best practices as I'm on, a, on that journey myself, but what I will share with you is that if, for a person like me personally who 
as a PMO leader, we're kind of mired in detail and a lot of data. And what I have personally learned is that you, you have to have a simple and compelling message uh, to all the different stakeholders within your business that when you say it, they understand exactly the change you're trying to drive. And that, and, and I would also emphasize that stakeholder partnership and stakeholder management on an ongoing basis is such a critical factor in driving any kind of change because those leaders, you want them to be the shepherds of your change, that they are starting to speak the language of change that you're trying to promote and that they're driving that change through their constituents, through their organizations as a part of your business so that it pollinates everywhere throughout your business. And then you can see the culture start to shift. So the key takeaway is that it's not Corey's idea or it's not the PMO's idea. It's the business's idea to transform and that each function is looking at what's my role in that transformation and trying to foster that change. Okay, that sounds great. Well, just so you know, we had a lot of excellent positive feedback in our text chat, and we can't thank you enough for this great opening keynote session. So I'll be closing the session. I want to thank you, Corey, and all the attendees for this first session, and we'll go ahead and end the meeting so you can get ready for your next session. Thanks, everyone.